Hey everybody and welcome to a Dominions 5 strategy video where I'm going to try and uh, deal with the topic of flyers. Um, I'm choosing to do this video because I've got a little bit of experience with flyers and because I was thinking about how to analyze Dominions as a game and I realized that it's really easy to get lost in the fact that there are many, 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 many factions in this game. Um, I think there's something like 30 something at peak uh, in some of the ages, which is so much that for a new player coming in and thinking about this game, um, analyzing and understanding every nation in the game is not an, like, an immediately predictable goal. Like realistically, you're gonna be reading up on people you're playing against or someone you're playing as, as you play in a particular game. But there are other ways to think about those nations rather than as completely distinct units. And I started thinking about this and I was like, well, one of the things that makes nations unique is uh, the chassis, the basic, the species, if you like, that they use um, to build their nation out of. Because, for example, uh, human nations often have a lot in common with each other in terms of the, the basic like techniques and tactics and how they play underpinning them. People talk about uh, elves, people, people talk about giants, people talk about humans um, as different, uh, I suppose, groups um, of individual races that make up the, the nations in the game that play rather similarly both uh, with and against. So I was like, okay, how can I take that up to, uh, to another higher level? And I was like, really, you can split nations in the game into, at the very least, uh, aquatic nations that are designed to be purely aquatic, uh, the amphibious, the truly amphibious band of nations, which have two subsets, those that start, prefer land but can go in water and those that start in the water but can go on land. You've got the terrestrial nations, which includes uh, the monkey nations, the elven nations, the human nations, etc. Um, you've got, and then you've got, um, I'd say, let's put pop kills to one side as their own special breed, uh, and then you have uh, a couple of categories of flying nations. And I thought, okay, the flying nations are distinct enough and different enough from everyone else that maybe they're a useful topic to talk about as a whole. So what I want to do today is talk about um, the three main species groups that make up the flying nations in Dominions 5. As I see it, like disclaimer, I am still a relatively new player and I've played one flying nation in my time. Um, so we'll go through the, the species that make up the flying nations. Um, what makes them different as, a, as chassis from say humans, elves and the other categories of units that you might encounter? And then I want to talk through what that means in terms of how you conduct yourself strategically, how you conduct yourself operationally, and how you structure your battles tactically to build a picture of how one would play birds, flyers, or whatever category um, if you have them available to your nation. Because I really do think that it changes your, your play style probably more than any other designator other than being a pop kill being a pop kill nation. So let's jump into it. What, what makes up the, the flying nations in the game? I've started a game where I'm the player of all four nations just so I can easily demonstrate units and uh, show you unit lists. And I've brought up four nations that demonstrate the four main categories of flyers that I want to talk about today. There are other niche cases, but these are the ones I want to talk about. We've got Miklam, Kalem, Raga, and Jabalba. And these represent four categories of flyers. You have the Kalian species, uh, which are basically birdmen, human, humanoids with a large set of wings. You've got Jabalbans, who are bat people, who are size one, uh, size one diminutive individuals like bat people. Um, you've got flying cavalry nations. Now, flying cavalry isn't usually the entirety of a nation, but there are some nations like Raga, and you'll notice Raga also has Kalians, um, that have flying cavalry type um, units. This includes uh, most notably wind riders from Arcosafali in the early age. You've got uh, independent Pegasus riders are seen quite often. Um, and then infamously the late age Ragan uh, Zayedan, the immortals, uh, who are the, the Turan immortal units, the Abyssian heritage immortal units. And these are characterized by being large, uh, sorry, a human-sized individual on a large flying combat mount. 
And the fourth category of flyer, who I will only talk about at the end of the video, is a, is a flyer who is not a flyer strategically, but is a flyer tactically. And this is the Miklanese Eagle Warrior. Eagle Warriors walk. Eagle Warriors are ordinary humans for the purpose of walking. They are ordinary humans for the purpose of size and statistics, but they can fly in battle. That means that when I talk about battle tactics, it applies to Eagle Warriors, It does, but none of the strategic or operational concerns apply to them. Let's have a look at each of these species in turn and point out some of the features that makes them different from, say, humans. I'll use humans as the baseline here um, because they're common across a lot of nations and because a lot of other species are similar to humans but with minor alterations. So uh, Atavi and Venara monkeys are similar to humans with adjustments. Chudes are better humans. Fearbolg are better humans. Elves are humans with glamour, which is a bigger change, but it's still there. And nation, uh, Ormish humans are slightly different to early age of Morian humans, are slightly different to Manish humans, are slightly different to independent humans, with the Ormish being the, the most distinct there by having less magic resistance. You get the picture. Humans are a useful baseline to compare to because you will encounter lots of them when you take Indie provinces, and you'll get a pretty good idea of what a human soldier can do. So let's talk about the Kalians first. Kalians are a as I said before, a race of winged humans. So what you have is a is a human, essentially, uh, with a pair of wings that's capable of making them fly. What are the essential characteristics of a Kalian? Um, the first thing to note is that they're usually in the, the... The chassis is no more expensive than a human. So you're essentially paying for the humans, not necessarily for the wings. You pay for the wings, however, in other elements. What are those other elements? The most important is size and protection. So a Kalian unit will always be size 3. Um, this represents the fact that these wings are so bulky that you can't pack many of these guys into a phalanx uh, as you would, say, an ordinary uh, shield wall of heavy infantry. These wings get in the way. As a result, there needs to be more spacing between the individual troops so they can only fit... You can only fit 200 Kalians in the space that would be occupied by 300 ordinary humans. What this means is that they receive more attacks on average per unit, and they issue fewer attacks per square um, than a human would. What you get in return for that is the fact that they can fly, and that tra usually translates into a higher map move, flying map move, and we'll talk about what that means in terms of strategy, relatively standard statistics, but then also usually pretty hard limits on protection. Um, Kalian units, because they have to fly, uh, Ill Winter represents most of them, with the exception of the Iceclads, who I'll talk about in a second, as like the, the, the single exception. Um, Kalian units can't really wear particularly heavy armour. They cap out these Raptorians who are late age, iron users, cap out at around 14 protection. That just doesn't fly for human humanoid heavy infantry. It doesn't fly for Manish heavy infantry, for Maronese units. It doesn't fly, it doesn't fly for Orm at any stretch of the imagination, which basically means that a Kalian unit is more fragile than a human. It is usually less well armoured, will be taking more attacks because of square density, while dealing less. Um, some of them uh, are also slightly weaker in terms of strength. Uh, you'll see that with the area subspecies in particular. There are some exceptions. Uh, the exception is the, uh, the Iceclads, which are capital only. They're not always capital only, I believe, for all ages of Kalim. Uh, and these are relatively heavily armoured, cold protection, Units, they still suffer from, well, one, being incredibly resource intensive, uh, and secondly, from being um, uh, still limited by attack density um, and things like that, and being relatively low damage output. Uh, in some ages, you can get, I believe, s uh, sacred flying Kalian troops as well, which is interesting, um, but doesn't really deal with the underlying problems that these guys are generally... Uh, less good in a stand-up fight, but more mobile because of that size 3 flying combination. The Zot uh, goes the... Um, instead of sacrificing going up to size 3 and thus losing square density, Zots, who are bat people, they live, they're native to the caves of the Dominion's world, um, remain size 2 by simply being smaller. Uh, they are diminutive, they're smaller than humans, therefore even with their wings spread, or contracted rather, they're able to fight in formations of 300 to 300. The sacrifice you make then is the fact that, as a result, uh, they're pretty damn small. So a Zot's warrior is everything you'd expect from a relatively small unit. He's slightly cheaper than a human, 
uh, but he's weaker. His stats are not great. And again, they run into the limit of um, not being able to particularly protect themselves very well because they have to fly. So the best you'll get in this late age, the bulb and lineup, which is remember, the late age is an obsidian cuirass, uh, which will give you, well, it's 15 prod on the body, no protection on the head, so an average protection of 12. Um, most Jabalban units will suffer for doing damage because of their low strength, although they tend to carry uh, two-handed, highly damaging weapons to compensate, which means no shield. Awkward. Why is that a problem? Because if you have no shield and you're wearing no protection and your defense skill is average, then you are going to die like a fly. Uh, these things smash up against... They drop down in huge numbers on enemy infantry formations, and they just melt because they're, they're underprotected, they're vulnerable, but they're relatively mobile. Uh, they're still flyers. They're easy to mass because they don't tend to have very high uh, resource costs because they're often close to naked. Um, and they hit reasonably hard. So these are swarming size 2 flyers. Strategically very similar to the Kalians, uh, tactically very different. Flying Cavalry is an interesting one. Flying Cavalry comes in a couple of different flavors, as I mentioned. I'm talking about the Ziedans because they're the most game-defining example, but you can also talk about things like Wind Riders, as I said. Um, these units uh, are interesting because the nations that have them don't tend to have their Mage Core be entirely flying. Um, in the case of Raga, for example, there are cold recruit mages, but the cold recruit mages, you'll, you'll be heat in order to recruit the Ziedans, which means you'll be stuck with the walking uh, Karapan and Dastur mages instead of, and uh, Turan sorcerers, instead of like the area seraphs and things like that, who could fly alongside these units. Which means that they get pushed into a niche role as usually as raiders, or in the case of the Ziedans, like they're the expansion parties, they're a lot of the killing power, and they work alongside the, um, the land movement troops. Characteristics of the cavalry is they tend to not have the same weaknesses as Kalians. Um, they tend to be larger, at least be moderately well protected. Um, but they make up for this by often being really expensive in resources or gold or having even lower square density, um, which you get when you start talking about flying cavalry. Um, size 4 flying cavalry and size 5 flying cavalry are in a particularly awkward spot because it means they can't share a spot with another one of their kind, unlike a Kalian, which means you're down to a square density of 1. Doesn't matter in the case of the Ziedan though, when you have 3 standard attacks and a lance, um, and often these guys will be hell blessed. But they're they're limited in terms of their... They're like ordinary heavy cavalry or medium cavalry in the case of some examples, except they again pay a size tax and sometimes a cost tax to be able to fly. Also noteworthy, Ziedans get flying movement but not a particularly high map move. So those are our, those are our different categories, I suppose, of flyers. What does this mean in terms of how you play your nation? There's a couple of overarching things we need to get out straight away. The first is we've acknowledged that in most cases, pound for pound, a flying unit is not going to match an equivalent, uh, an equivalent unit um, that is terrestrial only. A, if you were to get a direct equivalent to a Ziedan and took its wings off and brought its size down, it might be more useful. Uh, it would be a heavy cavalryman around size 3, there'd be a 2 per square. A better example would be the Kalians. Um, when Kalians fight humans, humans win a stand-up fight with Kalians every day of the week because the humans have the, you know, physics comes into play and the humans can wear heavier equipment um, and they tend to be, and they're packed in tighter in their formations. Um, this makes it very difficult for flying nations to win stand-up fights against equal numbers of opponents because you will usually be more spread out unless you're really smart with your tactical scripting, so we'll talk about that later. But you have, a, you have a combat weakness. The Kalians get embarrassed, actually, because the Atlanteans later on discover their icecraft and technology. But because Atlanteans are muscled, strong, terrestrial creatures who are also often underwater, which supports the weight even more, presumably... Um, they can wear much thicker versions of the ice protection and get really, really good protection values with relatively low encumbrance figures um, and do it to a lot more of their troops rather than just their capital-only elites, um, which is awkward um, when you invent something and someone else does it better than you. 
But hey, the Kalians can fly and the Atlanteans can't. So you struggle to win stand-up fights. Um, but what you gain in return is uh, a huge amount of strategic mobility. So let's talk about what you gain in terms of strategic mobility with a, uh, and then later on we'll talk about what it means in the battlefield. So a flying unit in Dominions is subject to a different movement calculation than other units. And you can go into the Dominions 5 manual to check this. Here's, here's the essential difference. Normally what happens when a unit is moving over a piece of terrain is that you pay movement points in half movements. You pay to move into a province and you pay to move out of a province. The cost you pay to move is dependent on the terrain. Plains are relatively easy to move for, through. Forests, mountains, much harder and tend to slow you down. Enemy terrain has an extremely high movement uh, cost, which makes it very... like Land units tracing through... Um, Land units won't trace through. For all intents and purposes, you won't see land units move through enemy land provinces. I don't think I've ever seen it happen. Um, flying units are different. Flying units pay, I believe, three movement points per half move. Um, three or four. I'll check that at some point. Um, you pay regardless of what the terrain that you're moving over is. So if there is a forest, if there's a mountain or whatever, in this case, mountains... Um, flying units will movement right over, um, treating this basically the same as if it were planes. The flying units don't care. All they need is somewhere to land occasionally and they can keep jumping. Um, moving in those short, uh, those short jumps, they don't actually need to traverse most of the difficult terrain, so they move relatively quickly. So instantly, you have your standard army, instead of moving one and maybe two provinces in friendly territory, will always move two or even three provinces um, in friendly territory in the case of larger movement units. We've got a 22 movement point flyer here, and there you are. Movement over two friendly provinces into an enemy province. Um, very, very useful off the bat. The second thing to note is the tax for flying over. Let's just advance the turn. The tax for flying over enemy provinces uh, is much lower. I think it's one extra movement point for per movement step. Either way, it's much, much lower. What this means is it's possible for you to realistically have a threat range. With a standard stack of infantry, you'll usually be able to threaten, certainly using Kalians, and I believe Zots are the same with a lot of their units. Yeah, map move 20, map move 20, what are the heavy guys? Map move, yeah, okay, so they can do it. The slowest would probably be Nazkan, Hatun, Runa. Um, but even they can consistently jump over one enemy territory to hit one behind it. What this means is that when you're about to go to war with someone, the front line looks very, very different. When two terrestrial nations, if, if land nations were lined up with armies here and armies here, this nation would have to prepare for this army to move here, here, or here. Um, this nation would need to prepare for this army here, for example, to move here, 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 or here. The threat range is relatively limited, which means you tend to want to butt heads directly and form death stacks and smash into each other. Flyers increase the threat range dramatically, especially if it's a flyer fighting against a flyer. In that case, this province, this province, this province, this province, this province, and this province, and this province, and this one, and this one, are all threatened by this army here. This army can end up anywhere in this in this space. And if you design specialized high movement thugs, then you, you might bring this province and this pro like all of this into the threat range. Um, at the same time, if you advance against a flyer, it's possible he could consolidate from here, 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 here. All of these could choose to consolidate either in a, one offensive against you or your army coming together into one place. So what does that change strategically? What is the fact that you can threaten more provinces and defend more provinces in terms of mobility change? It means that you are better positioned, all else being equal, to fight an economic rather than a war, an economic war rather than a war of annihilation. There is more incentive for flyers to break their forces up into multiple smaller stacks and hit as many provinces as possible, and then consolidate. Um, when it's time to fight battles because your armies can support themselves better over longer distances because more of them are mobile. Um, it introduces 
two things into the equation. The first is it introduces an economic advantage. It's easier for a flying nation to take lots of provinces in a single turn than it is for an equally sized land nation. It's much harder for the flying nation to win a stand up battle against an equal number of enemies, but it's easier for them to raid a large number of provinces, which predisposes them towards raiding. If you take six provinces per turn and your enemy takes two provinces back, then you're going to win the war ultimately because you'll just produce enough birds that you're able to overcome them eventually. Or in the case of Jabalba, you're scaling up your blood economy enough and you're killing them with sacred blood summons. Um, if they then counter that, and this probably verges into operation, operational considerations, if the enemy then disperses his, his, his army into small groups to counter your small raiding groups, then you can consolidate multiple small raiding groups onto one of his broken up armies, annihilate it, and defeat him in detail. Um, that sounds great in theory. You're like, wow, flyers must be overpowered. Um, the reality is that you're at a combat disadvantage and there's a price to be paid for that and terrestrial nations have options. Thugs are, are one example of things you can use to counter flyers, although they won't get through all their buff script if your flyers are involved. Um, so you're predisposed towards a raiding war and you're predisposed towards large alpha strikes too. You're striking two or th two, even three provinces deep along your entire border with someone. You can even jump over, as I did in my Nazkin game, you can jump over if there's one nation here and another nation here, you don't even border him. You can commence your invasion over someone else's territory, take a fort over here to establish a new income zone and go from there. You can take a beachhead, much like a sailing nation uh, landing from a long distance away. It can lead to some quite interesting surprises. So that's, that's strategic implication number one. The strategic implication number two is that it makes combat much, much more uncertain for both your opponent and for you. What do I mean? By increasing the number of possibilities, you're decreasing the all else being equal probability of any given move. It's less certain where your army is going to be. Because he's less certain or she is less certain or they are less certain of where your army is going to be, um, you can't be as certain about where they're going to move in response. Because if they're going to be playing a constant game of trying to guess where your flyers are moving, and players can respond to this in probably two ways. Either they can try and ign largely ignore the raiding and beeline and take your fortresses, or um, they can try and counter the raiding. Those are two completely different approaches. Um, this uncertainty means that flyers end up being high risk, high reward. Um, because it's harder to predict what forces will be colliding, where the enemy is going, and harder for them to predict where you're going, the range of, of results broadens, uh, and you can win or lose big in any given turn, and you will have heart attacks before you cycle big turns, because you just don't know what's going to happen. The amount of uncertainty that's been introduced is, is very, very large. So intelligence over where the opponent's armies are becomes particularly important. Uh, feeding your opponent's false information becomes particularly important. Uh, training them that you're fighting a certain way and then keep and then adjusting that continuously is probably also useful. Um, but overall, what I would say is flyers give themselves over to one of two styles of warfare, um, raiding warfare that grinds an opponent down or rapid alpha strikes that consolidate large numbers of forces um, and destroy armies in detail. The final thing I'll say about strategy um, verging into operational concerns as flyers is that Birds have, let's bring, the, let's bring the Kaelians back up again, they're just, they're just a good example. Normally a unit's siege strength um, is 1 and 0.5 for a 10 strength unit. So a human gives one siege attack and one uh, half a siege defense point. If you fly, the number is doubled. So instantly, if you put wings on it, even Jabalbans, who have terrible strength, will still contribute human level siege, uh, siege power, despite being eight gold, two resources, and six recruitment points in the case of a, a dart thrower. Um, this means that you are very good at sieging things. The reason I split out flying cavalry is that they are not good generally at sieging things because you get three siege power for 125 gold in the case of a, a, Turin, a Turin Griffin rider. Um, but uh, Kaelians, Zots, like decent siege units. Kaelians in particular, very good siege value, which means that if you collapse on fortresses, you can probably take them relatively quickly. Um, 
that leads into operational questions. How do I conduct how do I conduct my wars once I've decided whether I'm fighting a raiding war or whether I'm fighting a, a sort of an alpha strike followed by a attempt to wipe out my opponent's armies. Um, the key with operationally when using birds is to understand uh, I would say retreat mechanics. So retreat paths and retreat mechanics um, to understand when to consolidate and to understand when to split. So let's, let's talk about these three in turn. The retreat mechanics is important when you're raiding. Um, you need to make sure that you always raid such a way that you think two provinces paired together will be taken successfully. So try and take three in this in this trio, for example, knowing that if you miss one, you'll take the two. The reason is, if flyers when flyers route um, before a battle is over, you tend to they tend to definitely retreat because they uh, jump off the battlefield in one motion rather than slowly walking off the battlefield or limping in the case of the wounded. A flyer will disappear from the battlefield pretty much instantly. Uh, which means retreats are likely to lead to your units getting off the battlefield. That means you're going to lose a lot of units on retreat unless you can secure a retreat path for them to move to. And that's why taking paired provinces is fine. Even if they're not connected all the way back to your heartland, although that does cut you off from income, uh, make sure you take pairs in order to ensure that you don't lose large forces to retreats. In terms of when to split and when to consolidate, um, splitting is high reward for flyers because it allows them to extend their raiding range even more. Uh, having four commanders with 30 or 40 troops each hitting four provinces is far more effective than having one uh, with all the troops consolidated hitting one province really really hard if all you're going to be facing is enemy PD. But when you're not facing enemy PD um, consolidation becomes the name of the game. Consolidation is where you'll bring multiple forces from a dispersed area together into one location with the idea that you're going to win a specific battle or hold a specific province. Usually trying to catch the enemy off guard because you'll need to outnumber them usually in order to win. Um, bringing more forces than he can. So essentially what you'll want to be doing is trying to, if you're fighting this raiding sort of war, is encourage your opponent to spread and spread and spread to counter your harassment and your raiding. And then once he's spread out too much, pick an, pick an area and annihilate it. Hit that province, hit the t hit the surrounding provinces, hit them all really hard, and annihilate that section of the enemy army. Uh, hopefully, for limited your losses on your part, and then deal with the rest. That's your that's I suppose the the flyer's way of warfare. Um, but that flyer way of warfare is useless. I'm trying to keep this. I'm, you can tell I'm trying to keep this movement this video moving because I'm hoping to generate. Uh, input and questions and which I can then use to come back to this topic. Um, the operational why of how you control your armies um, doesn't mean anything if you don't know how to actually win a battle with birds. So let's talk about how birds fight on the battlefield because it's really really uh, unique. Um, the first thing to say about bird battles is that you have much less control over them than you have over ordinary humans. And that's because you basically have two settings. Attack something and hold and attack something. Attack something means that after a turn, the flyers will jump up and appear on the battlefield near something else, uh, whatever you've set them to attack. Hold and attack means you get two rounds and then they jump. What you don't have, unlike ordinary infantry, and that happens whether they're back here, whether they're here, or whatever. You don't have the ability to, as you do with human infantry, to say, set them back here in a line, say, hold an attack closest, knowing that it's going to take two before they start even moving, and then three, four, five before they finally make contact. Which means that if you have, you have a very limited time in order to buff, your units are going to be off the ground quickly. You're going to be in the opponent's face quickly. So if you're going to be casting support magic, do it do it quickly. Um, early in the game that's less important and early in the game you can lead yourself over to the... sorry one second. Sorry about that. Um, so as I was saying, in the early game how do flyers fight? Um, I'm mostly talking here about... I'm mostly talking here about, here about Kalians and to a lesser extent Zots but this is partly applicable to those with flying cavalry except in those cases um, land troops will, will, if you're not using a flying only party, form one part of this equation. The basic concept of early expansion with flyers is to have one group of flyers serve as a, a blocker, so to jump onto the closest enemy and draw in all the enemy aggro on hold and attack, 
and the other to be on hold and attack rear, with the understanding that the AI will usually set all of its commanders in the rear and doesn't tend to use bodyguards. And you'll kill a lot of mages, priests, commanders, and rout a lot of forces without actually having to beat them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, in some risky cases, you can even choose to go without the blockers. Um, the hold is to allow the enemy to get a little bit further away uh, from their commanders before you finally jump. Now, I can't use... I was going to try and use... Um, the um, Zots there for an example, but because they are also flyers, it wouldn't be a very good example now, would it? So let's fly down here and demonstrate the basic concept against Raga. No idea if we won or lost, because no idea what the default... Okay, so almost no PD. Uh, unfortunately here the commander is a flyer, but they should still hang around in the back, which should be fine. Anyway, so the troops come forward, getting ahead of their commander, and then after a certain number of rounds has elapsed, these units will take off. There we go. Some will drop here and block the troops that will be coming towards it, and the others will kill the commander, and there should be a notification popping up any second that they are routed. There they are. So at this, and this point they're routed, and because they're routed, um, their attack skill takes a negative 4 nerf, their defense takes a negative 4 nerf, and they won't be attacking under most circumstances, and they're usually wiped out. So that's how you can expand using relatively weak troops relatively efficiently. Um, you need to pick your enemies, um, but it also means that you get great utility out of lances. So the lance, because it does bonus damage on the first strike, both in terms of attack value and in terms of damage, uh, lances make very good flying troops because it means that in that first turn where they drop, um, they tend to they're more likely than say a sword arm troop to kill the to kill the enemy in that first attack. Um, as you transition into the late early game and you start talk, talking about beating players, uh, you can't assume that attack rear is going to work because what most players will do is uh, set uh, a unit of troops behind their commanders, put their commanders in the middle, so create this sort of uh, defensive sandwich, which means that when your flyers drop, they'll drop on this here, which is usually a hardcore of infantry in box formation. If they're not doing this, then you'll slaughter their commanders and their mages. Um, there's two things you can do about this. Either you can... Uh, oh, no, let's say there, there are three things if we're looking for just troop-based solutions. The first is you can concentrate on winning the battle with this front group, which is put everything on hold and attack closest, put all of your units in box formation, and try and outnumber this group. The reason outnumbering is good as flyers is because as a flyer, even though you have less density per square, unless you're Zots, and, you, and then you're, you're just shit, uh, getting a full surround means that when there's on these individual corners of this box formation, on the edges, as long as there's no gaps, these three human troops, or one giant or whatever, on this corner is fighting three squares of your guys, which means it's a six on three advantage. Which means, especially if you're using lances, in the first turn you should collapse and start to roll up these corners by creating some quite favourable geometry along them, rolling up wherever you actually outnumber the enemy. So by dropping everything on someone at the same time and getting a really good surround, works really well if they're in line formation by the way, because you'll usually land on an edge and wipe them out on the charge, um, you can compensate partly for the, the lack of power of your units. Works with some sort of enemies, doesn't work with others. Wouldn't try it on black plate infantry for example, because they're just too tough for you. You need to come up with alternative solutions, usually magic and raiding, because Ormish are slow. The second thing is you can try and gamble and get these commanders anyway. You do that by going hold and attack none. Hold and attack none rolls a random target of the enemy's squads to, to drop on, and commanders are squads. Um, one sec. So commanders, archers, whatever you can drop on them. Some nations you can go hold and attack cavalry or large monsters and be guaranteed to get the mages. Uh, the Vanir are particularly vulnerable to hold and attack enemy cavalry. Um, not the Vanir, the... Um, TNN, Tinanog, um, can have fly, has no flying uh, troops, but does have, uh, sorry, not flying, uh, cavalry troops, no cavalry troops, but cavalry mages, uh, which makes them vulnerable to this sort of tactic. Or you can just go ahead and do it anyway, and do the tactic I said before, try and block this group, 
kill this group and then move up, but this group's here to bait you in the first instance, and you can bet that once you land here and get distracted, this group will usually be closer to the mages than this group, because this group's goal is to get forward, if they're the enemies, to get forward and kill your troops that are on hold, 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 stay behind troops in the back, or on cast spells. So they're going to try and murder you, so you need to block them. These mages here will usually open up with any invocations they have at you on close range. So you need to be aware of that when you're fighting humans early on. Uh, the hold and attack rear... Like, you need to mix hold and attack closest, hold and attack rear. If you're uh, massively outnumbering them, if you're not outnumbering them, think about the tactics you're going to use in order to win those fights. Once mages get involved, um, flying nations are interesting compared to non-flying nations because of how little control you have over your troops moving forward. And when I talk about tactics for flyers... Um, Miklanese eagle warriors are included in this because they fly on the battlefield. So for scripting purposes, we need to think of them as birds. What does that mean in terms of birds and the integration of battle magic in the mid game? The first is that it's harder to do systemic buffs on your troops because you only have them around for two turns. You have enough time for, uh, for example, earth mages have enough time to earth power and throw an earth buff once before the infantry are out of their range. If you were using blocks of Ulmish infantry surrounding mages instead, you would get might get one or two more, you'd definitely get at least one more cast, you might get two more casts, because of the time it takes for them to walk away after the hold order wears off. Um, you could even set your tr infantry behind your mages, as I did as Atlantis, in order to give your units more buff time. So, your buffs have to go off quicker, and you won't get as many of them. Which is awkward, because birds love buffs. It does mean battlefield-wide buffs are particularly useful because it means you'll hit the troops even once they have made contact with the enemy. The second thing to note is that evocations become much dicier. Um, because you'll be surrounding the enemy and because if the enemy has multiple squads, you'll be intermixed among them, you'll be filling the gaps, and you'll be there really quickly, there's really not much time for you to do a huge amount of damage with evocations. You've got one round where you sure you'll be safe if you're on hold. The second round, if it's particularly long travel time in the air, the spell may actually still be landing at the time that your troops finally arrive, which is problematic. It limits the ability of bird nations to effectively use evocations without fear of friendly fire, because there's very few things you can throw that won't decimate your own units. Um, there are some exceptions. Um, if you look at some of the Kalians, for example, the area, the area are cold resistant 15, which means if you use uh, things like falling frost, um, you are in less danger of friendly fire. But then you need to set your mages far forward in range of the enemy because your flyers will get there and freeze the enemy relatively quickly. The enemy won't have time to walk into range. So advance and cast spells may be called for there. So limited evocations, we love battlefield wide buffs, uh, localized buffs are harder to use. It also makes your commanders harder to protect. You get bodyguards, of course, but it's hard to tell your units to just be a block between you and the enemy in a massive line formation, because even a line formation of flyers, once it flies, will pick an enemy squad and drop around that squad, which makes it easy for cavalry to get around you, at which case you might need secondary squads on hold and attack cavalry. All of this leads to the conclusion that battles with flyers reward you bringing far more troops than the enemies, and tactically revolve around killing the enemy really, really quickly. You can't grind them out. You need to kill them in the drop, you need to backstab their mages in the case of um, independence or certain player armies, and your magic needs to be tuned to the fact that your army is ultimately airborne. Um, Preferably, your mages will be airborne too, and you can bring them with your forces and be completely mobile. If not, then all of your strategic considerations become very different, and your flyers become raiding only forces, and the mages become necessary for your actual battle armies, which will be hybrids. Uh, Raga can be in this category, where they move away from, if they're heat, their mage core will be walking, the Ziedans will be raiding or consolidating to kill, but the actual battle army will consist of... Uh, to run, uh, to run cavalry or infantry protecting mages, and in many ways that hybrid that hybrid force, while removing the freedom of being able to dump all your mages with your flyers everywhere, which is lots and lots of fun, um, does give you the best of both worlds in terms of options. The final thing I'll say in terms of flyers and their forces is that you can make or non-flyers into flyers through use of wing shoes, and most flyers have all particularly the Kalians, have lots and lots of air access. So if you find interesting nature, indies, or whatever that you want to bring along, uh, give them some boots, give them some gear, 
uh, bring them along. Your troops will your troops will really appreciate it. Um, so let's 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 summarize and then see what sort of response this video gets. Um, flyers, four basic types. Zots, who are weak as shit, but they're the size of humans. Kalians, larger than humans, but roughly humans in stats, but underprotected. And then uh, those nations that aren't flyers, but use flying cavalry. Or, and finally, those nations that only have tactical flyers. Only example I can really think of right now is uh, Miklan. Strategically, flyers um, beg for either raiding wars or um, wars of rapid annihilation where you drop multiple forces by surprise on individual enemy stacks. They reward um, knowing when to split your forces and when to consolidate them for individual battles. Um, they can't win stand-up even fights under all else being equal. Their, their troops are usually inferior to a land recruit troop of the same cost and circumstances packed into the same area. Um, so they need to outnumber their enemies. Um, but they're very good at sieging and they're very good at raiding, which combined makes it relatively easy to win an economic war if you are equally competent and equally resourced to your opponent and have some way to keep them from, for example, just rolling to your cap and taking it while you are distracted taking a bunch of their territory. Um, enemies will come up with counters uh, eventually. Um, some of those counters, I won't go into depth, but uh, counters include Storm. Uh, storm stops your units flying. It is an air spell. It is so dangerous that if your units are not storm flying, which is the ability to fly even in a storm, that you should seriously consider whether or not you should target someone else if they are an air nation with storm access at that point in the game. Um, it's debilitating because at that point your units walk towards the enemy um, rather than fly, uh, at which point they're just shitty, they're shitty infantry. Um, there are ways to use this though. Um, if you have storm flyers, you can use storm and then use it to throw lightning strikes at the same time. Or you can, if your goal is to use evos that we ruled out before, and this is particularly important for not this version of Kalem, but er earlier versions of Kalem, which have much better, um, much stronger air mages. Um, you can deliberately use storm to stop your infantry advancing on your opponents, uh, and then use storm to storm power and boost up a whole bunch of thunder strikers and destroy the enemy. Um, it also is great if instead of using your flyers you want to use air elementals um, and things like that to add some nuance to your force uh, rather than rely on your bird troops. My point is there that um, there are things you can do that stop you acting like birds at which point you're just a different nation. With you. At that point you're just a high air nation, right? You're just a Thunderstrike nation or an air elemental nation, the birds are kind of irrelevant except for the fact that the flying got your units there in the first place. If someone casts Perpetual Storm, you're kind of screwed because at that point all of your mages are walking on the strategic map as well. But I've never seen Perpetual Storm cast in a, in a competitive game. Um, tactically speaking, they reward uh, backstabbing against indies against other troops, against other nations, for example, they reward bringing more troops to the fight than the other, more than most other sorts of troops, because they need complete surrounds in order to uh, break down the corners of enemy formations. They love lances because of the high alpha damage, and because they're so fragile, they want the war to be over quickly. Um, they're hard to use evocations with unless you're um, willing to accept either friendly fire, or you're a niche case like Kalem, where you have things like storm flyers that let you Combine your love of lightning strike, a uh, thunder strike, with your love of flying, um, and they also have the option to just cause chaos. Uh, more than, not more than anything else, but also noteworthy is just to reiterate that point I made about them being harder to predict. Birds are harder to predict. Flyers are harder to predict. Both, uh, and thus they make their enemies also harder to predict by requiring them to make more decisions. By putting more provinces in their movement ranges, um, by being more terrain agnostic, um, birds make it harder for opponents to predict where they will go, and it makes for the birds harder to predict exactly where your opponent will guess you're going. Um, that can be not... There are circumstances where it's not a two-way street, however. For example, if there are rivers that your opponent cannot cross, but your birds can fly over them. If there are mountain passes your opponent can cross that you can fly over but they can't walk over because of the climactic conditions. Keep an eye on that because that might be an opportunity for you to wage war where you're literally under no threat, where you can raid, 
um, and drive them mad but aren't actually under any threat yourself. Always good to know. Anyway, that's my summary on, on uh, flyers and what makes them different strategically, operationally, tactically. Um, this isn't intended to be a substitute for a nation analysis and a lot of these characteristics are things that you'll go into more if I ever analyze, for example, uh, the Kalian line, which I'm considering. Uh, I probably won't analyze the Jabalban line that's been done, but I will happily take, um, put in the um, comments, nations that you would particularly like me to take a look at, particularly ones that haven't already been covered by someone more experienced than me, um, that you'd like to hear my opinion on and I'll give them a breakdown uh, sometime soon. So thank you for listening uh, and talk to you all again soon.